while they're getting that ready and starting to pass it out, I'll sort of give you guys the introduction to what's, uh, what's going on today. Since it is Father's Day, I wanted us to focus on uh, a story from the Bible about a father, a man named Abraham. Now, to understand the background of Abraham, you have to know Abraham uh, was, was a very elderly man. His wife was very old, and they never were able to have any children. Now, Abraham uh, trusted God enough, and God eventually made Abraham a promise that he would have children someday, and that through those children there would come a great nation, and that um, of that great nation, uh, God would bless all people in the world, which he did through Jesus Christ. But one day, the story I want to look at today is in Genesis 22. One day, God decided to test Abraham and tell him to sacrifice his own son as a burnt offering. Now, that sounds difficult, and that sounds harsh, um, but I want to look at the story in a little bit of detail. Basically, Abraham obeys God. He trusts God enough. He goes, and he, before he actually does the action and actually kills his own son, God stops him and provides a substitute so that he doesn't have to sacrifice his son Isaac. Now, I think that is a wonderful story for Father's Day, and it may not seem like it would be, but I want to look at it in a little bit more Detail. You see, Abraham, even though he's going to sacrifice his own son, Abraham is a very, very good father. And I think actually this whole ordeal actually turned out for Isaac's own good. Well, we know that Isaac grew up to be a godly man. It tells us in Genesis 24 that apparently it was his practice to meditate on God. He was a good husband who loved his wife, did God. In Genesis 26, it tells us that he obeyed God. In Genesis 27, it tells us that he blessed his children by God. So even though uh, Isaac went through this strange happening where his father tried to kill him, he still grew up to be a very good godly man, and he seemed to be respectful to his father. Good father because Abraham himself was a godly man. And that's what I want to look at today. To be more godly is to be a better father. Now, this does not only apply to people who have younger children. The father-child relationship continues your entire life. In fact, this does not only apply to fathers. I would broaden it to say to be a more godly person, to be more godly is to be a better father, a better mother, a better child, a better friend, a better person in general. But since uh, we are focusing on fathers today for Father's Day, since our story is centered around the father, I want to focus specifically on how being more godly will help to be a better Father. And this is not intended to say that if a man is not a Christian, he's incapable of being a good father. All this is saying is that the more godly uh, we become, the better we become. So I want to look in Genesis chapter 22 today. I want to look at three traits of a godly man that make a very good father in this story where Abraham tries to kill his own son. So in Genesis 22, starting in verse 1, it tells us sometime later, that's after Isaac was born, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Well, first characteristic of a godly, good father is love obviously. Abraham was a man of love. Love characterized who he was. We see all throughout Abraham's life that he loves people immensely. He loves his wife, and he's very patient with her, much more patient than what he might probably should have been at times. He was very loving towards her. He had another son by a different woman named Ishmael, and he was very, very loving towards Ishmael when he disinherited Ishmael because God told him to. Uh, he was brokenhearted over it because he loved Ishmael so immensely and now he has his son Isaac. I want you to think about this. There's no doubt that he loves his son Isaac. God addresses him as your son whom you love. Think about this. Abraham and Sarah never had children their whole life. Once they were very, 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 very old, they finally had a, ch a son that God promised them who was supposed to be the son of, who was going to be his heir and going to be the son of the promise. And at this time, Abraham and Sarah are also very, very, very rich. So he's very old, the child they were never supposed to have, and they're very rich. Can you imagine how spoiled 
Isaac probably was when you put all of those together. You see, a good godly father loves his children. But it goes beyond that. A good godly person is characterized by the nature of love. Real love is more than what we give it credit for. We try to reduce it down to this thing that we think of when we think of romantic comedies. But real love is to actively seek the good of another person. It's done in action. First John 3.18 says, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with... Now, to love is a godly trait that makes you a good father. Obviously. Why are we even talking about this? This should be so plain to us. Well, because it is very, very simple in concept. But sometimes it can maybe be difficult in application. You see, real love demands that we show love in action, even when we don't desire it. Luke 6.27, Jesus said, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. That's what love is, is to do good even when it's not convenient. Now I know fathers love their children. What father does not love his children? But I'm not talking about caring about people. I'm talking about actively, constantly seeking their good in everything you do. Loving your children in action will mean always showing patience. It will mean showing the right amount of discipline, not being too lenient, not being too strict. Loving your children in action will mean loving your wife, because that is good for your children. So considering that sort of thing, what father loves his children perfectly all the time? Keep in mind, we're talking about showing love. Here's the thing, it's easy to show your kids that you love them when you're proud of them. It's hard when they disappoint you. It's easy to show your kids that you love them when they behave. It's harder when they throw a temper tantrum in the store and they embarrass you. It's easy to show your kids you love them when they show that they love you. It's hard when they go through a rebellious phase and say they hate you and they want to run away from home. It's easy to tell your kids, I told you so, to satisfy your own ego. But it's hard to put that aside and actively seek their good. It's easy to love your daughter when she marries a multimillionaire who wants to build his mansion right next door to your house so that he doesn't take her away from you. It's hard to show love to her when she ends up pregnant before she's married. Take a lesson from God's love. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we are at our absolute most unlovable that is when God loved us the most in action through Jesus Christ. And no story illustrates this concept of love better than the story of, a prodigal, of the prodigal son that Jesus told. A son goes to his father and says, I want my inheritance now. Now, you put that in context. Essentially, what this son is saying is, I don't want to wait for you to die. You might as well be dead to me right now. Give me my money. The father does it. The son goes off and wasted, and then when he comes back humbly looking for any type of relationship, even the relationship of being a servant to his father, his father just loves him immensely and welcomes him back in as a son. You see, it's not, any, it's not a coincidence that Jesus used a loving father to illustrate God's relationship to us, because that's exactly what God is. He is a loving father. 1 John 3.1 says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. You see, God's love as a father actually can provide a, lo a model for, uh, for us as fathers, for earthly fathers. It makes sense that if we follow God's example, him being the perfect father, we will know how to love better. So the only question is, how do we know how exactly God would show love to a person, how he would treat someone as a child? Well, the only way to know how God would treat a person is to know him better. The better you know God, the better you know how to love. And the better you know how to love, well, the better father, mother, friend, person, Christian you'll be. And so, men, I'll make you this promise today. I promise you that the best thing a man can do for his family is to know God better. I promise that. Love is a godly trait. It makes for a good father. Let's look at another godly trait that Abraham exhibits here. In Genesis 22, 9, he takes his son, uh, Isaac, and they head to this place God told him to go and sacrifice him. And in verse 9, it says, When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. 
Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Very godly trait is to be completely, wholly, totally committed to God. So here Abraham takes his son to this mountain in the region of Moriah. Now, 2 Chronicles identifies this mountain later on as Mount Zion, where the temple of the Lord was built. Um, Today, the temple is no longer there. there. This is actually a picture of the spot now. That's inside a mosque called the Dome of the Rock. And that rock at the very bottom of the picture there is believed, no way to know for sure, but it's believed to be the place where Abraham built the altar to sacrifice his son on. So... Abraham was so committed to God that he was willing to go this far, go so far as to kill his own son out of his commitment. So we have to ask the question, what is wrong with Abraham that he would do that? Why would he listen to God if God commanded something like that? Well, basically because Abraham trusted God. It may be that Abraham did not think that this would actually be the end of his son. In Hebrews 11:17, the author writes, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. See, the author of Hebrews, who was very, very well-versed and well-studied in Judaism, was under the impression that Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, believing that after he did, God could bring Isaac back to life. Well, that's not exactly how it did happen. Abraham's assumption might have been off there, but very likely Abraham still trusted that God would do something with Isaac even despite this. Now, this is where we say, we said this in our Sunday night Bible study not too long ago when we went over this. This is where we say Isaac should have been a head case. Someone brought that up after we talked about the story in our Bible study. You would think If your father tried to sacrifice you when you were young, there would be some sort of lasting emotional or mental damage that uh, that resulted from something like that. I know I would be pretty messed up if my father had tried to kill me like that when I was young. But think about it this way. Maybe I'm a radical, but I really think this was good for Isaac. And let me explain. I think for two reasons this was very good for him. First off, he saw... Isaac saw a wonderful example of commitment to God in his father. His father loved him immensely, but he loved God more. That was good for Isaac to see that. Second, he saw that the God his father worshipped is good. God did not allow Abraham to kill Isaac. He would not permit something like that. It was only to test him. And so that showed Isaac, because God spared his life, that God is not some psychotic killer who wants his followers to sacrifice their children. He's not someone who caters to sexual perversion by promising his followers that they have virgins in heaven. He's not someone who fails and is faulted just like human beings. He's a good God. And I'm willing to bet that probably showed Isaac in turn that his father's faith was well placed. And I think the results speak for that. We've already seen that Isaac grew up to be a good godly man. And it doesn't tell us anywhere that Isaac hated his father for this, unless he was a teenager, but then he would have hated him anyway, so it doesn't matter. I want to give you two reasons why I think commitment to God will make you a better person and certainly a better father. First off, it is beneficial for you and your entire family. God gives us commands. He gives us a standard to live up to, a standard of godliness, but he doesn't do it for no reason. It is actually good for us. He is looking out for our well-being. Jeremiah of his people, I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me for their own good and for the good of their children after them. So it's good for us and our family to be for us to be committed to God. Second, if you are committed to God, you will be a model for your children and for other people. If parents, especially fathers, are serving as a good model for faith, it's only going to help their children to develop spiritually. J.C. Blackburn was telling me a few weeks ago about a guy he met uh, while he was driving trucks. And uh, he was speaking with this guy one time. They were sitting around talking. The guy was saying, I think I'm a pretty good father. 
I send my kids to church every Sunday. And Jay said, well, you shouldn't do that. The guy said, well, what should I do? Jay said, well, you probably ought to take your kids to church every Sunday. Because, you know, if they see their father going and taking the faith seriously, well, that's only going to serve as a model for them to follow. If children don't see their parents taking their faith seriously, well, it's not going to matter much to them. God recognized the importance of this type of thing. In Deuteronomy 4.9, he tells the Israelites, be careful and watch yourselves closely that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Then he says, teach them to your children and to their children after them. It is important for a parent to instill the Christian faith in their children. And that's not going to be very effective if they are not living that faith themselves. I went to a wedding reception, or a wedding, this uh, past couple days, Friday and Saturday. And it was a good friend of mine from college who was getting married. And uh, while we, were, uh, we, we all got there together and we helped set up for the wedding Friday night, and then we were going to his church. He's a youth minister at a church. We were going to his church to do a bachelor party and just to play soccer and volleyball and basketball and lots of sports. Because um, apparently I found out after we got there, we all like sports, I guess. So we got together for the bachelor party. We were starting to ride from the wedding location to the church. And I jumped in the car with a couple of old friends of mine from college. Not the one who was getting married, but a couple of other friends. And they were driving me there. And I was really surprised at the change I saw in these guys the second the doors on the car closed. As soon as the doors closed, as soon as all the other people around could not hear us, I didn't know they did things like this, but everything about them changed. Their language changed. Their attitude changed, the type of things they talk about, the type of things they bragged about, the type of things they said they wanted to do, it changed drastically. And it was not very Christian. And I was really, I was appalled at the kind of change that took place in them. It was discouraging. I'm a Christian, and it almost put a bad taste in my mouth for Christianity. Because I saw these guys, they had this commitment to Christ, but they don't take it very seriously. It made me really question how committed they really were. And I couldn't help but think, if, I'm a non if, I was, if I was not a Christian, I would never, I would never accept Christ after seeing that. Because if a person's not going to serve as a model of faith, who's going to take them seriously when it comes to talking about their faith? Now that's certainly, certainly true of all people, but especially true of parents to children. Commitment is important. But the thing is, commitment has almost sort of become a dirty word in our culture. Now, Men, the unfortunate truth is women tend to be more committed to things than we do. That's just statistically true. Um, now, maybe in some cases that's a good thing. In some cases that might be a bad thing. Now, I don't know why. Maybe women will uh, say we're just afraid to commit. Maybe we'll say we're smart and we don't want to overcommit ourselves. But unfortunately, men do not tend to be as committed to women when it comes to faith, when it comes to church, when it comes to active service to God. Now that was actually true to some degree during Jesus' ministry. That was true in some places in the uh, early church in the New Testament. That's true in many churches today, and if I can be honest, I think to a large degree that's very true in our church as well. In most churches you'll find much of the work and much of the initiative is taken by women, whereas men are more content to sit. And that's just not the way that it should be. The way God desires is that all followers, men and women, all people, give 100%. And so I'll make you another promise. I promise you that the more committed your life is to God, the better off your family will be. The more seriously you take your commitment to God, the better your family will be. I'm not talking about making more money. I'm not talking about bad things never happening in your family. But in terms of spiritual maturity and eternal significance, I promise your family will be better off. So, godly traits that make a good father. Love, commitment to God. There's one more here. So let's look at it in Genesis 22, verse 12. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord says to Abraham, Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, The Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord, 
it will be provided. Now, this last characteristic, I find it hard to put into one word, but maybe that's because I have a small vocabulary. But it's a good father, a good godly person is never too harsh with his children. They understand the right line as far as intensity. Now, this trait is actually not shown by Abraham to Isaac. This trait is shown to Abraham by God as a heavenly father. You see, a good father is never going to be harsh with his children. Now, God, being a good heavenly father, is not allowing Abraham to sacrifice his son. Isaac was never in any danger at all because God never intended to allow him to die. 2 Corinthians 4.8 says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. You see, God, as a loving Father, will not allow circumstances to be too difficult for us to handle, let alone telling us to take part in things that are too difficult for us to handle. God would not allow Abraham to go all the way to sacrifice his son because that would be contrary to God's nature, and that might have been more than Abraham could realistically handle. God would not be harsh on him. A good father is not going to press his children too much. Ephesians 6.4 puts it this way, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, what does it mean to exasperate children? What's exasperate? Well, to embitter, to enrage, to expect more than what is actually fair. Now, granted, there are times where fathers may be called to be strict, but to be strict to too, de to too great a degree is being harsh. Now, this is something that human beings do all the time, and we don't realize it. When kids don't live up to the expectations that, are, that, that people have and that their parents have, when they don't turn out to be as good athletes as their fathers were, when they don't turn out to be as smart as their mothers were and do as well in school, they can be pressed too hard and sometimes perhaps unfairly. When fathers discipline their, ang their uh, children out of anger instead of out of love, that can exasperate a child. That can embitter them. That can leave a poor impression on them. I had a friend when I was in high school. We played basketball together. Um, I remember we went to one game. It was a game at another school. It was a couple-hour drive away. But we went to this game, and... Um, he was a very good player. He had an incredible shot. He could stand 10 feet behind the three-point line and sink shots all the time, very easily. He's a very, very good shot. And he was in the game playing, and I had a prime view of what happened in this game because I was right there in my best spot on the bench watching him. And he came up, and he got the ball just inside the three-point line, completely clear, not a single person around him. He could have taken a shot, and he probably would have made it because he was such a good shot. But instead, he just kind of panicked, and he dribbled it in and went in a few feet and then went up for the shot. And by the time he did that, people had surrounded him, and they had their hands in his face, and he ended up missing that shot. He would have had a good chance had he stayed where he was and just taken an open shot of the basket. Well, after the game, um, we were done, and his father came up and was speaking to him and said, Jeffrey, why didn't you take that shot? There was no encouragement, not, it's okay, you'll get it next time. It was why did you drive in? Why didn't you take the shot? You should have stayed where you were. Well, a little, a little strict, but not too bad. Later on, um, I was actually riding back with them. My parents didn't go to the game because they knew how good I was at my position. So I was riding back with my friend and his dad. And I was sitting in the back seat. My friend was in the front seat uh, driving. And we got into the car and started heading back on this long trip. And his dad was just saying, I can't believe, I can't believe you didn't take the shot. You drove it in. Why did you put it on the floor? You could have made that shot for a long time. A little bit further into the trip, everything had been quiet for a while. No more, no more talking. We were tired, or Jeffrey was tired. I felt fine. I hadn't done anything. And he laid over his head, and he fell asleep in his chair in the front seat there. And as he was sleeping, just driving down the road, his father, no reason, nothing to prompt it, he reached over, nudged his son, and woke him up and said, Jeffrey, why didn't you take that was being harsh. That was inappropriate. That was not being the kind of father that God intends. All that over a basketball game. Not even over a basketball game. Over one shot in a basketball game. It's completely unnecessary. You see, a godly father is not harsh. He does not exasperate his children. 
Now, men, we could apply this in many ways. We have to recognize what is being too harsh. To do that, we need godly wisdom. We need to know God better. But rather, I'm going to leave that there, and I'm going to turn my attention. Women, I have been neglecting you this whole time, and I am very sorry, and you have been wonderful sports about all this. So I want to focus on you for just a minute. All this that I've been talking about so far, it's not all just the men. You actually have a very important job as well. Genesis 2.18 says, the Lord, God, the Lord God said when he made Adam, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, wives, you have a very important job to fulfill. You are a helper. Understand, this is not derogatory in any way at all. This is not saying, stand over on the side and stay out of my way, and that's how you help me. No, you have a very important role that only you can fulfill. It is your job to help your husband. It is your job to help them to be a spiritual leader and a man of God, like they should be. Now, you don't do that through telling them what to do or trying to regulate them or nagging them. Rather, you do that through gently, lovingly, sincerely encouraging them. When your husband has a bad day, be understanding, be gracious, be sympathetic. When he has a bad meeting he has to go to and you know he's dreading it, tell him you're going to pray for him. But your job is to help him be the good father, the good leader, the good husband, the good man that God intended him to be. So your job is incredibly incredibly important. So, love, commitment to God, gentleness, and never being too harsh. They're all godly traits, and they're all wonderful things that help to be a better father, but also a better mother, a better friend, a better person in general. These are the kind of things that need to be developed. And I promise you, the more you develop godly traits in your life, the better off you will be. Now, there's an incredibly important part in this passage that I left out. I read about it, but I didn't really speak on it. You see, right when Abraham was about to kill his son, God stopped him, and God saved Isaac by providing a substitute. Abraham looked over into the thicket, and there was a ram that was caught by its horns. And so that was God saying, your son does not have to pay this price. I'll pay it instead. And he provided the sacrifice. Well, that is some very important theological significance behind that sacrifice because that foreshadows what we call substitutionary atonement. You see, for us as well, right when we were at the worst part, right when we were about to pay a serious penalty, God stopped it all and said, wait, I'll provide a substitute. And his name was Jesus. So if there's anyone here who has never accepted Jesus, if you want Christ to be your substitute as well, and that way you can have access to the grace of God that will help you be a better father or a better husband or a better wife or a better brother or a better friend, I want to invite you to come forward and speak with me while we sing.